Let me introduce in a few words this wonderful book of Nehemiah. If you notice the use of the first person pronoun in verse 1 of Nehemiah 1 gives the impression that Nehemiah was the writer. If Ezra was the writer, he was copying from the journal of Nehemiah. This book, as was true in the book of Ezra, has copies of letters, decrees, registers and other documents. The same man wrote both books. The writer, perhaps, was Ezra. The books of Ezra and Nehemiah are one book in the Hebrew canon. Nehemiah, friends, was a layman. Ezra was a priest. In the book of Ezra, the emphasis is upon the rebuilding of the temple. Ezra was a priest. In the book of Nehemiah, the emphasis is upon the rebuilding of the walls of Jerusalem. Nehemiah the layman. In Ezra, we have the religious aspect of the return. Nehemiah, the political aspect of the return. Ezra is a fine representative of the priest and of the scribe. Whereas, on the other hand, Nehemiah, a noble representative of the businessman. Nehemiah had an important office in the court of the powerful Persian king Artaxerxes. But his heart was with God's people and God's program in Jerusalem. The personal note is the main characteristic of the book. I find myself coming to this book again and again because of the kind of book this wonderful book is chronologically. This is the last of all the historical books in the Old Testament. We come to the end of the line as far as time is concerned, as far as the Jews are concerned. The Old Testament goes no further with their history. The book of Ezra picks up the thread of the story about 70 years after Second Chronicles. The 70 years of captivity are over and a remnant returns to the land of Israel. The return under Ezra took place about 50 years after the return of Zerubbabel. Nehemiah returned about 15 years after Ezra. These figures, friends, are approximate and are given to show the stages in the history of Israel after their captivity. This enables us to see how the 70 weeks of Daniel fit into the picture in a normal and reasonable way. When we come to the book of Daniel, we would be, in a very specific way, studying these 70 weeks. The 70 weeks of Daniel begin with the book of Nehemiah and not with the book of Ezra. From the commandment to restore and to rebuild Jerusalem to the Messiah, the prince will be seven weeks and three score and two weeks. I'm reading from Daniel chapter 9 and verse 25. Friends, the background of the events in Nehemiah is the street will be built again and the wall even in troubled times. Now let's get into the book of Nehemiah, the very first chapter. God's chosen people are called to be witnesses against pseudo-worship. But too often they themselves succumbed and they became themselves pseudo-worshippers. God sent them to Babylon, the fountainhead of all false worship, to take the gold cure. They returned repudiating pseudo-worship. Their restoration was incomplete, however, they were not free from this time on, right to the time of the Roman Empire. The New Testament, we realize, opens with them under the rule of Rome. Now, friends, three men played important roles in the rebuilding of Jerusalem. Zerubbabel the prince, who represented the political side, Ezra the priest, and finally, Nehemiah, the layman, Zerubbabel, 
Ezra, the priest, and Nehemiah, the king, the priest, and the prophet, actually failed to rebuild the walls of Jerusalem and cleanse the temple. So God raised up Nehemiah, whom we refer to as a layman. Frankly, friends, it is a rather unfortunate distinction today to talk about the clergy and the layman. One is half of the other, and really, we need both. Nehemiah, friends, believed in watching and in working. He also believed in working and in praying. Watch and pray. Work and pray are words that characterize this man, Nehemiah. He had a good garment job in Persia. He was cupbearer to the king. He was a good, moral, honest man. He could have remained in Persia, but if he had, he would not have been in the record of God. We would never have heard of him. I want you to notice some of the things that mark out this man as we get acquainted with him. Let me introduce to you Nehemiah, the loyal layman. The first seven chapters of this book deal with the rebuilding of the walls. The rest of the book deals with revival and reform. The first chapter begins with Nehemiah's prayer. Nehemiah chapter 1 verse 1 and words of Nehemiah son of Hakaliah in the month of Kislev in the twentieth year while I was in the citadel of Susa Hanani one of my brothers came from Judah with some other men. I questioned them about the Jewish remnant that survived the exile and also about Jerusalem. Two questions. One, about the Jewish remnant that survived the exile. The second question was about Jerusalem. When Nehemiah speaks of the Jewish remnant that survived, the Jews that had escaped in other versions, he is referring to those Jews who had returned to the land post-captivity. Nehemiah could have returned to the land along with them, but for some reason, Nehemiah does not. He took a job instead. Friends, I don't want to get into criticizing this man of God because we would see how God uses men like this. And certainly God chooses to use Nehemiah. Notice again that this man with an important position had a concern for God's work deeply concerned about God's cause. One day, while he was busy going back and forth in the palace, he saw one of his own countrymen who had just arrived from Jerusalem, who was probably bringing with him a message to the palace. Nehemiah stopped him and asked him, How are things going in the land? And notice the word he received. They said to him, verse 3, Those who survived the exile are back in the province. They are in great trouble and in great disgrace. The wall of Jerusalem is broken down. Its gates have been burned with fire. The exilees are in great trouble. The wall broken down. The gates burned with fire. This is a very sad, pitiful spectacle of God's cause and God's people. The Jews were in disrepute because they had failed and God could not afford to let that happen. Nehemiah became extremely concerned about this report and there are several things he could have said in reply. But you notice what Nehemiah did. Amazing man. Verse 4. When I heard these things, I sat down and wept. For some days I mourned and fasted and prayed before the God of heaven. As I said, friends, there are several things I would like to call your attention to in this particular verse. Nehemiah was not indifferent to the sad plight of the people, and neither was he a critic. 
he could have said the people should have done this and should have done that. Nehemiah was concerned. Now looking back at the book of Ezra, do you remember his reaction to the condition of the people? Ezra was a priest and he too was concerned. Now notice a layman here who is also concerned. While I think that Ezra was an older man, I believe Nehemiah was a much younger man. Ezra probably was a little boy at the time of captivity, but it is my opinion that Nehemiah was born during the captivity as had many others. This is the reason when we are studying Ezra that I did not criticize these people for remaining in Babylon. Although they were out of the will of God, there were some very godly people who did not return to the land. But notice this amazing expression, friends. When Nehemiah got the news about the exiles, the first thing he did was to sit down and weep. Remember, Nehemiah was on state business, but this did not keep him from sitting down and weeping. Notice that he mourned certain days. He fasted and he prayed. This was the resource and this was the recourse of Nehemiah. That is what Ezra also did. And now Nehemiah also weeps and prays. Once again, friends, I must call your attention to the expression in this verse, the God of heaven. This same expression occurs in the books of Ezra, Nehemiah and Daniel. It is a designation of God, which is peculiar to these three books. After the fall of Jerusalem, the destruction of Jerusalem, God could no longer be identified with the temple as the one who dwelt between the cherubim. The glory, remember, had departed Ichabod. Ichabod was written over the doorpost of Israel. The Lord God had returned to heaven. The glory had departed. For this reason, my friend, in the post-captivity books, he is not the Lord of the temple, but the Lord God, of heaven. He did not appear again until one time in Bethlehem when the angel of the Lord said, Glory to God in the highest and on earth peace, goodwill among men. We will never have peace on earth. We will never have goodwill among men unless we give glory to God in the highest the reason why the world is in such disarray, such confusion, is because we have lost our starting point. God is the prime mover, and once we move from the prime mover and attach glory to some other human being, this would result the confusion, the chaos in society. Remember, this God, the original the first source, the one who generated the world into existence. Remember, he created this wonderful cosmos from chaos. Unless we attribute to God glory in the highest, we will never have peace on earth. We will never have goodwill among men. This is what happened to the children of Israel. They robbed God of his glory. And the result, the consequence was captivity. We are in captivity today because we don't give God his due place in our lives. Christ had come to the earth, wailed in human flesh, wailed in flesh the Godhead see, hail incarnate deity, as that beautiful hymn says, the Christmas carol. Someday Jesus is coming again, the Lord Jesus Christ himself said, and then shall appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven. Matthew 24, 30. And then shall all the tribes of the earth mourn, and they shall see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven with power and 
great glory. Really, friends, I don't know what this sign is, but I rather suspect it is again the Shekinah glory of God coming back. Ichabod would never again be written on this world. However, in Nehemiah's day, he is the God of heaven. And Nehemiah addresses him in this way. What can I say, friends, but to say that this is one of the greatest prayers in the Bible. Actually, there'll be another one in chapter 9, but notice these wonderful words. O Lord, verse 5, God of heaven, the great and awesome God, who keeps his covenant of love with those who love him and obey his commands. God of heaven, great God, awesome God, covenant-keeping God, loving God to those who love him and obey his commands. Notice, friends, that God keeps his covenant of love only with those who love him and obey his commands. Really, God is an awesome God, the one who incites terror, but he is also the God who keeps the covenant of his mercy with those who love him and observe his commandments. On the one hand, God is a God of judgment, and on the other, the same God is a God of grace, a gracious God. Verse 6, Let your ear be attentive, your eyes be open to hear the prayer of your servant. The prayer your servant is praying before you day and night for your servants, the people of Israel. I confess the sins we Israelites, including myself and my father's house, have committed against you. Notice Nehemiah's phraseology in this prayer. Does Nehemiah say, I come to confess the sins they have sinned? No. He confessed the sins which we have sinned against thee. Both I and my father's house have sinned. Nehemiah nails it down. I'm a sinner. My father's house has sinned. The nation of Israel have sinned. How many times do we hear that kind of confession of sin in our day? In this prayer, Nehemiah made a confession. The failure of the Jews was because of sin. Nehemiah says, Both I and my father's house have sinned. This man was no self-righteous Pharisaic onlooker, but he internalized the pain that God felt when his people sinned against him. Sin is essentially against God. We have acted wickedly toward you. We have not obeyed the commands, decrees and laws you gave your servant Moses. We have acted wickedly, not obeyed the laws, the commands and decrees. We can see from this verse that Nehemiah believed God's word. Nehemiah rested on God's word. Nehemiah knew God's word. And he was concerned because God's word was being ignored. As we observe, friends, today Nehemiah's only recourse was God's clear word. Not only his recourse, but his resource. What place does God's word have in your heart? The only antidote to sin is God's word. The psalmist David said, Your word have I hid in my heart that I may not sin against you. When God's word is internally in your heart, Sin will disappear externally from your bodies. God's word that will keep you on the right track of life. Mm -hmm.